Okay, next section, pulmonary infections. The key discussion here is going to deal with pneumonia. Pneumonia is an infection of the lung parenchyma. It occurs when the normal defenses are impaired. Some of the normal defenses include our cough reflex. If that's impaired, there's an increased risk. Of course, the idea here would be that we're not able to remove organisms and particles that we would normally cough up. Damage to the mucociliary escalator can increase the risk for pneumonia. Recall that our lung conducting system that brings air into the lung is actually lined by respiratory epithelium, and respiratory epithelium is ciliated. Now, that's, those cilia are important because they beat upward and allow us to push the mucus that's present in the conducting portion of the lung up along the airway and then back down the throat so that we swallow uh, the mucus that um, is normally produced. Now, that's important because it helps us to clear um, anything that might be trapped within that mucus. And so damage to the mucociliary escalator would increase the risk for pneumonia. Uh, some examples of how you might damage that escalator would be if the patient has a viral pneumonia, um, that would damage the respiratory epithelial cells, and then because there is no mucociliary escalator, there would be an increased risk of developing a superimposed bacterial pneumonia on top of that viral pneumonia. And we'll talk about that in more detail as we move forward. Mucus plugging also increases the risk. For example, uh, you, you know that uh, anytime you block a tube in pathology, the general principle is that you get infection behind the block. And so mucus plugging would result in blocking of an airway, which would then increase the risk of infection uh, distal to that block. Clinically, the patients who have pneumonia present with fever and chills. Um, that's because they are, the, the organisms often leak out into the blood, which then results in fever and chills. Uh, there can be cough with yellow-green or rusty sputum. The yellow-green would represent pus and the rusty sputum representing uh, blood. Tachypnea with pleuritic chest pain can also be seen. This is particularly important, the pleuritic chest pain. The idea here is that when you breathe in, you uh, are stretching the pleura, and when you stretch the pleura, you get pain. And so that's called pleuritic chest pain, chest pain that arises when a patient expands the lung and stretches the pleura. Of course, the pleura is innervated, and what would sensitize these particular nerves in this region would be the presence of bradykinin and prostaglandin E2 that's generated by the inflammatory response. Of course, high yield to know that bradykinin and prostaglandin E2 are your two key mediators of pain. And then the patients will have decreased breath sound with dullness to percussion. The idea here is that the lung is like a drum. It's full of air. If you replace the air with consolidation due to uh, the production of exudate from the inflammatory response, that um, exudate will then decrease the breath sounds in that region along with resulting in a dullness to percussion. And finally, the white count will be elevated because the patient is infected, so you would expect to see an elevated white blood cell count. Diagnosis is often made by performing chest x-ray. Sputum gram stain can help to identify a bacteria along with culture, which can help to subtype that. Um, blood cultures are also useful because organisms will often be in the blood, as I've mentioned uh, just a moment ago. Now, classically on chest x-ray, there are three patterns that can be seen. Um, and the first pattern would be where the pneumonia pro produces consolidation that takes over an entire lobe. And so that is called a lobar pneumonia. Another possibility would be that you have consolidation that runs along the small airways. So it would be distributed in a patchy manner uh, along the small airways, and that's called a bronco pneumonia. And then the third possibility is where you don't have consolidation, but instead you have inflammation within the interstitium of the lung. And of course, the interstitium is the connective tissue of the alveolar air sac. Uh, and that's called an interstitial pneumonia, and the key pattern seen in an x-ray would be an increase in the lung markings, as if you're seeing, uh, as if the interstitium of all of these air sacs becomes slightly more visible, so you begin to see an increase in the markings of the lung. And I'll make all this very clear as we move forward on, on a couple sample uh, x-ray images. Now, important to note that when you think about lobar pneumonia and bronchopneumonia, which I've drawn here on the left, these are usually going to be bacterial. And then when you think about interstitial pneumonia, this is also called atypical pneumonia, and the organisms are not usually bacterial, but you think about perhaps virus. Um, and, and you'll see this as we move forward as well. Lobar pneumonia is a consolidation of the entire lobe, as I've already illustrated. Again, it's usually bacterial, as I've already uh, stated as well. Most important uh, to note on this particular slide is that the two most common causes of lobar pneumonia are strep pneumonia, which represents about 95% of lobar pneumonia, and then Klebsiella, which is a very high yield bug to be aware of, 
uh, for the purposes of examinations especially. Now here's what a lobar pneumonia looks like. I've already highlighted this principle. You get knockout of a lobe with consolidation and hence the, term lo hence the term lobar pneumonia. Now were you to look at this under a slide, what you would see is that the air sacs, these circles here that I'm drawing, they represent the air sacs. And you can see that the air sacs are full of neutrophils, um, which are all these cells present in the air sacs, along with this pink frothy material, which represents the exudate of the pneumonia. And so of course, if this was present within all the air sacs of a lobe, you would have wipe out of a lobe, and hence the picture that we just saw, which was the lobar pneumonia. Now again, I've told you that the two key causes, 95% is streptococcus pneumoniae. And um, as is stated in your text, this is the most common cause of community-acquired pneumonia, classically seen in middle-aged adults and the elderly. So strep pneumonia, 95% of lobar pneumonia. Klebsiella pneumoniae represents about 5% of lobar pneumonia, and what's the highest yield to understand about this is that it is an enteric flora that is aspirated. So it's classically going to be seen in patients at increased risk for aspiration. For example, elderly in nursing homes, alcoholics, these people are at increased risk for aspiration, and so those are the classic patients that get Klebsiella pneumoniae. Now, important to note that this bug has a thick mucoid capsule, and so when these patients present, they often present with current jelly sputum because, as they're, because part of what they cough up is this thick mucoid capsule. Now, Klebsiella often is complicated by an abscess, so it's not uncommon for patients with uh, Klebsiella to also develop an abscess. So those are some of the high yields to be aware of, especially for board examinations. Now, when a patient gets a lobar pneumonia, there are four classic phases that can be seen on pathology. The first is congestion, and the idea here is when you get infection, you're going to congest the blood vessels by dilating those blood vessels, increasing the amount of blood in the vessels, and also resulting in edema. So the very first phase is congestion, where you have congested vessels and edema. The second phase is called red hepatization. The idea here is that you develop an exudate within the lung. Uh, the exudate contains neutrophils and some blood, um, and that fills the alveolar air sacs, and it gives the normal spongy lung a solid consistency, and so hence the term hepatization, or liver-like change to the normal spongy lung. Uh, and of course, it's red here because it's, there's a lot of red blood cells that are also coming out into the alveolar airspace. Eventually, those red blood cells are broken down, and so it, it turns gray, and then we call that gray hepatization. And finally, you resolve the exudate. Uh, and then you begin healing, and that's called resolution. Very high yield to note that after a patient gets pneumonia, you pretty much heal the lung by, uh, by regenerating the tissue that was normally present. And remember that the type 2 pneumocyte, very high yield, the type 2 pneumocyte is the stem cell of the lung that helps to regenerate the lining uh, of the alveolar air sacs. Here's what a um, pneumonia would look like on gross exam. This represents the consolidated lobe, and so you can see that it becomes solid instead of spongy, and so that's where the term hepatization comes from, where it becomes much more like the liver than it does the normal spongy lung. And in this particular case, this is all full of red blood cells, and so this is red hepatization. Once the red cells are broken down, this would then turn gray, become gray hepatization, and finally it would resolve. Bronchopneumonia is when you get sc scattered patchy consolidation centered around bronchioles. It's often multifocal and bilateral, and again, as I've stated, it's caused by bacteria. Here's a classic picture showing you a bunch of splotches or areas of pneumonia, um, and again, that would represent a bronchopneumonia. Here's a gross picture of bronchopneumonia, highlighting the patchiness of the process, uh, and of course, this is running along the bronchioles. So scattered along the bronchioles are these patches of inflammation. Now the key causes of bronchopneumonia include Staph aureus. Um, very high yield to note a few things and I've listed them here. Uh, the first is that it is the most common cause of secondary pneumonia. Recall that secondary pneumonia is when you have bacterial pneumonia superimposed on a pre-existing viral infection of the lung. And again the idea here is that the virus knocks out the mucociliary escalator that increases the risk to develop a pneumonia. The patients subsequently get infected with Staph aureus, and that again re results in what we call uh, a secondary pneumonia. Staph aureus is often complicated by abscess or empyema, which refers to pus in the pleural space, and that's important to note as well. H-flu is another important cause of bronchopneumonia. 
This is a common cause of secondary pneumonia, which we've already talked about, uh, and pneumonia superimposed on COPD. So this can result in, in, in patients with COPD, they can get superimposed pneumonia, which then leads to exacerbation of the COPD. Pseudomonas aeruginosa can also cause a bronchopneumonia. The classic patient who develops this is the cystic fibrosis patient. Moraxella can, can create a bronchopneumonia. Now, this would be seen as a communi community acquired pneumonia and a pneumonia that could be superimposed on COPD, again, leading to an exacerbation of COPD. And then finally, Legionella is an important cause of community acquired pneumonia. Uh, it can also result in pneumonia superimposed on COPD or pneumonia in immunocompromised states. Very high yield to note for Legionella is that it often um, arises from a water source. And then also important to note is that it is an intracellular organism that is best visualized by silver stain. A third pattern of pneumonia is interstitial pneumonia, and this is when you get diffuse interstitial infiltrates within the lung. Of course, the interstitium, as I've already explained, is the connective tissue of the alveolar air sac. So if these are the alveolar air sacs, you begin to have inflammation within the wall of the alveolar air sacs without any um, major consolidation. Interstitial pneumonia is uh, often also called atypical pneumonia, and the word atypical helps me to remember a few things about interstitial pneumonia. First of all, the signs and symptoms are relatively atypical. Remember that in the classic patient with pneumonia, you would expect high fever, chills, uh, pleuritic chest pain, dullness to percussion, an elevated white blood cell count, etc. However, in interstitial pneumonia, the, the symptoms are much more upper respiratory symptoms, so that the patients have minimal sputum, they have cough, and they have, usually have a low fever. Here's a classic uh, image for an interstitial pneumonia. When you look at the lung, you can clearly see that the interstitium uh, is much more prominent, and you can clearly see that there's an increase in lung markings and interstitial processes occurring. Here's a picture of uh, interstitial pneumonia on biopsy, and what you would see is that the air sacs are predominantly empty. You don't see very many cells or much of an exudate within the air sacs. However, instead, you see a lot of inflammatory cells within the wall of the interstitium, and again, it's this interstitial process that results in the increased markings on x-ray. The other thing that the word atypical um, helps me to remember when I consider an interstitial pneumonia is that the bugs are, the, are usually atypical. They're not your classic pneumonia bugs. The most common cause of atypical pneumonia is mycoplasma pneumonia. Um, important to note that it usually affects young adults, classically military recruits or college students living in a dorm. Um, one of the high yield complications to be aware of is that it can produce a autoimmune hemolytic anemia. That's going to be an IgM. Uh, and so that's called a cold agglutinin. So it's one type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Um, and finally, important to note that it's not uh, usually visible on gram stain because it lacks a cell wall. So that's, these are all the high yields concerning mycoplasma. A chlamydia pneumonia is the second most common cause of atypical pneumonia in young adults. So if you have a young adult with the signs and symptoms of an atypical pneumonia and it's not mycoplasma, you want to think about chlamydia pneumonia. Um, RSV is the most common cause of atypical pneumonia in infants. Um, CMV is the classic cause of atypical pneumonia in patients who are on post-transplant immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, influenza is a classic cause of atypical pneumonia in the elderly. It can also be seen in the immunocompromised and those with pre-existing lung disease. Very high yield to know that patients who get influenza, they increase the risk for secondary pneumonia. This is very important to understand because the vast majority of patients who get influenza virus uh, as a cause of pneumonia don't die because of the flu virus. And they don't die because of the influenza virus. Instead, what happens is the influenza virus weakens the normal defenses, and that allows for a secondary bacterial pneumonia, which then kills the patient. And so it's important to note that Staph aureus is the most common cause of secondary pneumonia in patients who have um, influenza virus. Um, pneumonia. Coxiella is an important cause of atypical pneumonia in farmer and veterinarians. Uh, it's, it's classically associated with a high fever, so it's called Q fever. Remember that no, normally when you think about a interstitial pneumonia, the fever is usually low, and so it's important to note that these patients would have a high fever, and hence the term Q fever. Now, um, it, what happens in these particular patients is they get exposed to Coxiella spores, and that's because those spores are deposited on the cattle by ticks or are present in cattle placentas. And so if a cattle recently gave birth, uh, the placenta could potentially be a source of infection. 
Now, remember that from microbiology, that Coxiella is actually a rickettsial organism, but it's different from most other rickettsiae because, number one, it causes pneumonia. That's unique. Number two, it does not require an arthropod vector. It survives as a heat-resistant spore. And number three, it doesn't produce a skin rash, whereas most rickettsial organisms would. Aspiration pneumonia occurs in patients who are at risk for aspiration, for example, alcoholics or patients who are comatose. Uh, this is classically due to anaerobic bacteria from the oropharynx. And the three high-yield bugs to be aware of are bacterioides, fusobacterium, and peptococcus. These are commonly asked on examinations. R recall that when patients get aspiration pneumonia, the classic location is the right lower lobe, which then results in an abscess. Uh, and the right lower lobe is the classic location because anatomically the, main stem, the right main stem bronchus branches at a less acute angle than the left. So if this is the main airway and then you're looking at the branch, uh, this is the right and the left is, for example, like that. So it's much easier to go down the right than it is to go down the left, which then results in a right lower lobe um, abscess. The last of the pulmonary infections that we're going to discuss is tuberculosis. This arises with inhalation of aerosolized mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis. Remember that when a patient gets exposed to TB, they get primary TB. Now in primary TB, the patient gets focal caseating necrosis in the lung, usually the lower lobe, and also within the hilar lymph nodes. Of course, this, these foci are going to undergo fibrosis and calcification, and that results in formation of something called the GON complex which is basically an area of fibrosis and calcification indicating that the patient has un been exposed to primary TB. Now recall that primary TB is usually asymptomatic, so all the classic signs and symptoms of TB will not occur with this initial exposure, um, but the PPD will become positive. Of course, the only real complication of primary TB is the formation of a GON complex. Uh, that is a fibrosed and calcified uh, nodule that arises within the lung, uh, it's classically subplural. So notice out here, this is the pleura, and this represents the GON complex. Now, uh, patients usually develop a GON complex within the subpleural region of the lung, along with the hilar lymph nodes. Over time, this GON complex can become reactivated, uh, and that would then result in secondary TB. Now, this commonly arises due to AIDS. Uh, it can also be seen with aging. And of course, you know that because of AIDS, there's been an increase in the incidence of tuberculosis. Often it occurs at the apex of the lung and that's because the oxygen tension is highest at the apex of the lung. Now once a patient gets reactivation, then they develop uh, foci of caseous necrosis. They can also develop miliary pulmonary TB where you've got tiny little regions of TB that are sort of scattered across the entire lung. Uh, or you can, they can develop a bronchopneumonia due to TB. So they would get this classic bronchopneumonia pattern, um, but of course this would be due to TB. Clinically, these are the patients that present with fever and night sweats, cough with hemoptysis, weight loss. Uh, eventually a biopsy would be performed and it would reveal caseating granulomas. And of course the differential diagnosis of caseating granulomas includes uh, fungus and TB. And so an AFB stain would be performed and that would reveal the presence of red acid fast bacilli. This is the classic uh, picture of a caseating uh, necrotic granuloma. You can see the necrosis within the center of this granuloma along with the epithelioid histiocytes out here at the edge. Of course you would perform an AFB stain to confirm which organism is involved and in this particular case you can clearly see these red slender organisms which represent mycobacterium. Now remember that TB can also uh, spread to multiple distant sites within the body. It can basically spread to any tissue. However, there are a few high yield tissues to be aware of. First of all, it can go to the meninges, giving a patient meningitis. And important to remember that when it goes to the meningi meninges, it usually involves the meninges at the base of the brain. That's particularly high yield. So meningitis with granulomas at the base of the brain. It can also involve the cervical lymph nodes, the most common organ to be involved is the kidney, and when it involves the uh, kidney, it often produces a sterile pyuria. And finally, when it goes to the bone, uh, we call that pot disease, in particular when it involves the lumbar vertebral uh, bodies. And so these are some of the key sites of spread outside of the lung. And that concludes our discussion of pulmonary infection.